The Chicago Sting is the thing. The new team in town, bringing exciting big league soccer to Chicagoland. The Sting, team of the future in the sport of the future. Soccer, the all-world game, is the beautiful combination of all the mental and physical skills an individual can muster. For the player, it demands continuous decision-making, split-second timing, the balance of ballet, the ability to draw breath and muscular strength when every vital organ has advised the player that there's nothing left. For the spectator, and more and more Americans are taking to the world's most popular sport, soccer is a game that flows, a game of motion up and down the field, side to side, as the ball changes hands many times. Momentum becomes the prime objective, where the team with momentum takes command. Then it becomes a matter of creating scoring opportunities and taking advantage of those opportunities. In the past, soccer could be enjoyed only by the world traveler, along with 100,000 or more spectators in a giant stadium in South America or Europe, or on television in some European pub. But now the worldwide fervor is spreading across the United States, soccer's last major frontier. Taking the lead in this development is the North American Soccer League, America's third largest professional sports league. In five years, the North American Soccer League has mushroomed from five teams to 20. The future looks bright compared to the black clouds that hung over the league in 1969. 1975 saw the dawning of five new franchises, a television contract with the CBS Television Network, the first indoor tournament in history, and the signing of the legendary Pelé. In Chicago, the North American Soccer League thing is the sting, brought to the Windy City's competitive sports scene by Lee Stern, a sports-minded commodities broker, and coach Bill Folks, former captain of Manchester United and survivor of a tragic plane crash that nearly wiped out that great English first division team. When I first came over here, way back in January, I said that I was going to bring a skillful, attacking type of football to Chicago. I believe that we've uh, succeeded in bringing this. Uh, we've played very entertaining type football. We've, uh, we've entertained the crowd. There's been one thing missing in our, in our play, and that is the fact that we haven't been scoring the goals. People over here at the moment need to be educated in the, in the finer points of the game. And uh, when they see all the good build-up and the good passing, the movements of the players, good attacking movements of the players, if there's no end product, uh, if you don't really understand the game, then it becomes pointless. The Chicago Sting came away with respect, but not a championship finish in its first North American Soccer League season. Fans and rival players alike were impressed with the skillful play of the Sting, and after a roller coaster like season of ups and downs, the Chicago team came alive with five straight victories. And playoff hopes were not doused until the final second of the final game. That finale, in fact, went to the tiebreaker, which is the North American Soccer League's method for settling ties. It's a series of alternating penalty kicks, the team booting in the best of five, earning the victory. In the beginning, the Sting had trouble getting people to Soldier Field, as well as getting the ball into the net. Vancouver and Denver dealt opening losses to the Sting, and worse, held the new team scoreless. It looked like more of the same when Kyle Rowe Jr. and the Dallas Tornado visited Chicago. For more than 70 minutes, Sting efforts to score again proved futile as the Tornado pumped in two goals. But the Sting had knocked at the door too often to keep coming away empty-handed. Russell Allen was cut down from behind while maneuvering through the penalty area, and that set up a penalty kick. Gordon Hill, a slick little winger, banged it in for the Sting's first goal ever. Rudy Getzinger booted in the tying goal six minutes later. The game had dwindled down to the final four and a half minutes when the Sting stunned the Tornado with a brilliant goal and a diving header by Ian Moore on a cross from Gordon Hill. Victory. It was wonderful. Hill, the man who engineered the Sting's first victory, is called Merlin the Magician in his homeland, England. But it takes more than magic. Know-how and dedication are among the ingredients that make Gordon Hill a great soccer player. Gordon's fancy footwork and free-spirited actions on the field quickly made him a favorite with Soldier Field fans. He didn't let them down, producing enough goals and assists to rank him second among the North American Soccer League's leading scorers and impressing enemy players so much 
but they selected him to the league's all-star team. We deserved it, you know. We've uh, we've worked hard all week uh, trying different things, and it, they've just got to come off, you know. And we were very unfortunate. We could have beaten them, I think, about four or five if we'd have taken our chances. But as it is, you know, we didn't. And uh, you know, the one goal saw us through. You know, I would have liked three, but. Well, you know, you've got to wait for it, haven't you, really? And uh, I hope that um, on the replay we'll uh, do exactly the same. You know, uh, I don't. Uh, I've seen most of the most of the clubs and and, and that play in our division. Uh, and I'm quite certain that we can come off well top. You know, we're uh, we're a far better side, I think. And we, you know, we're willing to graft. I think if you're willing to graft at it, then it's got to come for you. No, no doubts in my mind at all that we're capable of beating uh, any any side. In we are very unfortunate. We're getting together. It's 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 a, it's a community. You know, this is what we want. And you're building that and teamwork. And we're building it up. And uh, I can promise this, you know, promise you that we're going to, you know, you're going to see some really good football. On Monday, May 12th, a big Englishman, Eddie May, captained his Wrexham team to the Welsh Cup Championship. Before the week was out, he had joined the Sting taken his first look at the Soldier Field AstroTurf and hoisted his 6-3 frame over Los Angeles Aztec defenders to head in the game's only goal for another Sting victory, beating the league's defending champions. Eddie May was to become an important figure for the Sting, first as captain and center back, later as a demon striker injecting needed punch into the Sting attack. Things seemed to be falling together for the Sting. Coach Bill Folks had his lads thinking creatively, moving the ball from the back, down the field, into scoring areas. The ball still wasn't going into the net enough, though, and the work went on. After a solid victory over the San Antonio Thunder, the sting went into a stretch when victories, as well as goals, became scarce. A heartbreaking tiebreaker loss to San Jose was followed by a shutout by the Portland Timbers, one of the North American Soccer League's top teams. The Sting played some of its best soccer, but bowed before more than 16,000 wild fans in Seattle. The Sting then squeaked past the Denver Dynamos, but lost in sudden death overtime to arch-rival St. Louis. The Philadelphia Adams, boasting the league's leading defense, and the leading goalkeeper, Bob Rigby, came to town confident of a low-scoring contest. For most of the first half, the game followed form. Gordon Hill managed to put one past Rigby late in the first half, and the Sting clung to a one to nothing halftime margin. But that was little hint of the storm to come. The pent up fury of the Sting unleashed itself just two minutes into the second half, when Hill rammed home a penalty shot, and his jubilant teammates began filing for scoring privileges. Less than four minutes later, the little winger launched a curling pass to Jim Lemon, who sent a low cross into the goal mouth for Stephen Schaefer to boot into the net. Eddie May butted in one unassisted, and Schaefer notched two more for a personal hat trick. It was the Sting's most productive day of the year, but coach folks must have wished they had saved a couple for a rainy day. That rainy day arrived on Friday the 13th. For nine wet minutes, the Sting and the St. Louis Stars jockeyed for the shallow end of the field before it was ruled no contest. Entering the second half of the season, coach folks felt his team was ready. But Dallas proved him wrong as the tornado imposed a setback and things indeed looked dim as the high-flying St. Louis Stars returned to Soldier Field to make up the rained-out date. But the Sting fought tooth and nail, battling the Stars and sometimes the referee with everything they had. They found the Stars were fit to be tied, and that's exactly what happened. When the smoke had cleared after regulation time ran out, plus two seven-and-a-half minutes sudden death over time periods, there was still no score, despite constant pounding on St. Louis goalkeeper Peter the Cat Bonetti. The Sting played one man short for nearly 50 minutes due to misbehavior, but stayed in control. That brought the decision down to the North American Soccer League's version of do or die, the tiebreaker. Remember, it was an ominous penalty kick series that eventually spelled disaster for the Sting at the end of their first season. A correctly taken penalty kick takes about five hundredths of a second to travel the 12 yards from penalty spot to goal line. The pressure on both kicker and goalkeeper is enormous. It is cruel tension you might expect from an Alfred Hitchcock thriller. The loser emerging with nothing, despite the 105-minute performance that forced a draw. First man up for the visiting stars was Dennis Burnett, who drove it past Sting goalie Mervyn Coston. Usually dependable Gordon Hill surprised everyone in Soldier Field by going over the bar, and the Sting was off on the wrong foot. Dynamite toad John Hawley was next for the stars, but goalie Coston rendered his shot harmless with a dive and a prayer. 
Rod Johnson carefully teed up the Sting's second opportunity. Was the cat invincible? Patrolling the net the way a panther protects his den, Bonetti had turned back everything that came his way. If Johnson was pondering the question, he refused to look at Bonetti. But he had to kick, so kick he did, past Bonetti's outstretched arms. Costin, the lanky young Briton with ice water trickling through his veins, was prepared both mentally and physically for the next shot, and Bob Matson's kick ricocheted off Merv's chest. The Sting gained the upper foot when Richard Green hoodwinked Benetti with a soft shot into the left side of the goal. As the pressure mounted, Gene Geimer tallied for St. Louis. Benny alone countered for the Sting, and Al Trost made it three of five for St. Louis. That left it up to curly-haired John Webb. With perfect form, head down and concentrating, Webb turned the ferocious cat into a helpless kitten up a tree with a soaring shot past Benetti's desperate fingertips. That made it four to three on penalties and gave the Sting a hard-earned one-to-nothing victory over the league leaders. Costin was the hero of this one, and he went on to finish fifth among the league's netminders with a 1.36 goals against average and four shutouts. It was the high-water mark of the season for the Sting, and the post-game celebration gave indication that more and more people were beginning to realize that the Sting is the thing. And less than a week later, a crowd of 14,000 turned out to witness an outstanding performance by the Sting against the touring Polish national squad, one of the world's top teams. On July 4th, following a whitewashing from the Central Division's cellar-dwelling San Antonio Thunder, the Sting was considered hopelessly out of the playoff picture, despite playing skillful, exciting soccer in most of their games. But Coach Fultz shook up the Sting lineup, switching center back Eddie May to striker and employing veteran Stefan Schaefer in a defensive sweeper role. Fultz had been looking without success for a productive striker all season, but May proved to be the answer. He was the right man at the right time. And Schaefer, who cleaned up everything that came his way, was the right man at sweeper. The strong, fast Chicagoan was a destructive force to enemy attack plans. The Sting surged upward. May scored five goals in his first three games at the new position and helped create increased scoring opportunities for other forwards, including that non-stop motion and droopy socks, Gordon Hill, who tallied goals in five straight games as the Sting won six of its last eight outings, including a three-to-nothing drubbing of the eventual league champion Tampa Bay Rowdies. Russell Allen, Benny Alone, and Ian Moore all had their turns as Hill's running made it forward. Increased playing time for midfielders Rudy Getzinger, Richard Green, and Jim Lemon was a key in the Sting's late title drive. Among the Sting's most consistent performers were sensational 20-year-old center back Clive Griffiths, young fullback John Webb, who replaced injured Eddie Cliff early in the season, and midfielder turned fullback Alex Skotarek, a Chicagoan who is a member of the United States national team. There were others. Pro veterans Willie Roy, ex-University of Illinois star who saw action at forward, midfielder, and defender. And Mike Wetter, an agile goalkeeper from Chicago who was NASL Rookie of the Year in 1972 with the St. Louis Stars, logged vital minutes for the Sting. It was a year to remember. No championship, but close. So the challenge is there for a drive to the title in 1976. What about the future for the Sting? The key to the Sting's future is the future of soccer, says Sting owner Lee Stern, and that lies with youth. Soccer is a sport that has been the mania of the world, but for decades has remained on the outer fringes of the sports scene in the United States. Now it has awakened, and soccer fever is spreading across the country. It's the fastest growing sport in America. Soccer is taking hold in our colleges, and thousands of high schools and grade schools have added soccer programs. The game is being played in the park districts and playgrounds more than ever before. The kids of today are the American Olympic national team and sting players of tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you. 